Hello everyone, this is Terry with Features.io, and as always, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome back Linda Rasky for today's webinar, Updated Momentum Tricks and Indicators. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the questions box. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the Futures.io website within 24 to 48 hours. If you're watching us afterwards on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the webinar. And as always, feel free to share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at Futures.io. And now, without further delay, I'll hand it over to Linda, and you'll get the pop-up again to share your screen. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, looking good, sounding good. She's all yours. Rock and roll. All right. Pretty good volatility in the market today. All kinds of different things going on. Uh, not always with the S&Ps, but you certainly had trend moves in the metals and uh, the yen and crude oil and yada, 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 yada. So there's always something going on somewhere. Today I'm going to start off by focusing on some of the early work of Arthur Sklaru, who wrote a book called Techniques of a Professional Commodity Chart Analyst that was published in 1980. And I've had this book in my library for quite a number of years, and I always find it useful for myself to pull out some of these old books once in a blue moon and skim through them again, and I always find something new that I might have overlooked. And then if I force myself to do a presentation, I find that I can always see things with new value and some other stuff, not so much. So I thought this was interesting for two regards. I love momentum work, and I thought I would go back, this is just my own curiosity, a couple weeks ago, and review Arthur Sklaru's momentum techniques. And he used to keep track of a net change oscillator by hand. That's a simple one period rate of change. And I can show that to you. And draw little trend lines on it. And so I started looking at it on other markets. And I thought, ah, you know, I just don't know what he was seeing. How can I make this work? But then you start playing around with things. And all of a sudden, little light bulbs go off. And you start to get at what he was really looking at. And it's just a great way when you show other tools and techniques and you start to take them and make them your own and play around with them, it draws you closer into the charts. And whether you actually use them in your toolbox or not going forward isn't the main point. The main point is to see things in slightly different ways and free yourself from the little structures and biases that we uh, get ourselves into. So what was particularly fun was I had tweeted that I was going to be doing something with Arthur Sklaru. It was actually for another presentation. And a longtime friend, Stanley Dash, contacted me. Uh, I think Stanley Dash is currently in charge of the CMT program up in New York. And he said, I used to sit next to Arthur at EF Hutton for 10 years. And I was sitting next to him while he worked on his book. And he used to show me early manuscripts that he was working on. And I was honestly flabbergasted because it's, it's pretty cool to find somebody that actually knew and worked with these people from the past. It adds a dimension of reality to it. And so he sent me this in an email. And then we did some emails following that as well. But he said that he was a meticulous and thoughtful and generous man. And he started in the business as a coffee taster. And he did all his charts by hand, of course, because they didn't have computers in the 60s and 70s. And he said he would spend hours comparing different moving averages and different types. And of course, he had to do them all by hand. And in his book, he makes a reference to just how much time he used to spend with his charting and how grateful he was to his wife, who shared him with the charts, as he put it. And that brings my point to 
uh, something else, and that is just how much time these people spend in the business, doing the research, doing the the study of the charts, and um, that's why he was a professional in the markets for 40 years. So I took a few of his key phrases from the book that picked a, uh, struck a, a general chord with myself, and this one in particular. A chartist's asset lies not so much in being able to forecast how high or how low a market will go or when it will get there, as in being able to identify the direction of a trend and to call the turn of the trend when it comes. And this um, is my philosophy that I can never predict how high or low a market's going to go or when it's going to go there or how long the duration of a trend is going to be. But there are very distinct signs at turning points that we can monitor that give us real good warning signs. And if you can catch the turn of a trend, and that's not trying to pick a top or a bottom, it's actually letting the market turn, there's an excellent risk reward at those points. As well as once you can really say there is a defined trend, you get to play the continuation patterns along the ways. And that's primarily what I do with my trading, you know, as opposed to trying to call a top or bottom. I'm, I'm following the market one data point at a time, and it sounds like that is very much what he did as well. Now, another interesting thing I found, these are quotes directly from his book. The zigzag pattern is the foundation of all chart formations and is the key to their forecasting value. So he would see if it's a head and shoulders or a triangle or a, or a rectangle or whatever you want to call it in the consolidation or the swings that come out of a consolidation, he viewed everything as zigzag patterns. And it's not literally always an ABC up or an ABC down type of rhythm, but it does give reference to the swing charts of the old masters, and I'm sure you all know that Gann was really a swing chartist, drawing the highs and lows and connecting them, as well as Wyckoff, and this is how the early um, uh, price recordings were done, by drawing these swing charts. And um, if you've seen my charts where I've done the same thing with the average true range, uh, or the red, green, red uh, bars, which I know I've published on many webinars, um, that's strictly defined by an average true range structure. And the nice thing is, is that we can, we can quantify it. So there is no gray area, per se, with a chart formation. In other words, the computer says black and white. It's not like, oh, I see one thing. Well, it could be this, you know, that type of thing. The second thing is that he always would put things in a context, framing out the zigzags in terms of the higher time frame zigzag. And, uh, you know, he didn't get caught up in the names of these things. He just uh, always would look at the rhythm of them. And just to give you a few examples, I've got a daily and a weekly chart, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this chart by now, but you can see that in, in retrospect, that daily chart down was really a big giant zigzag, if you will, with a zigzag in the middle. And again, don't take these literally that they're ABCs, but I just want to show this back and forth checking reaction. And again, on the weekly charts, if you're really interested in theory behind the technical analysis, Tony Plummer wrote an excellent book um, many years ago on forecasting the financial markets, and he gave a little bit more of the theory as to why the market does these zigzags or, or checking back and forth. To me, it's, it's a moot point. It's just a matter of um, always seeing them in terms of waves, if you will, and how important it is to put it in the context of the higher time frame. So, of course, in retrospect, the weekly charts look like a giant ABC down, but it sure didn't feel like that at the time because that last leg down was so extreme pushing into year end. And another another kudos to the fact that we can't say exactly how far it's going to go down or when it's going to end at the time. 
gold. Now, this chart was done um, at least a week or two ago, and it's sort of interesting because I was thinking at the time with this gold, we would go down and make a zigzag down on this daily chart at least, and I didn't know if we'd get down to 1280 or uh, what, what level we'd get down to. Sometimes you make a higher low, sometimes a lower low, of course, Droy. And what we actually did on the right-hand side on the two 40-minute charts was we tested just below that low before we had a couple-day rally, and uh, obviously, um, you can see we, we are, we're coming back down uh, now, and it's very possible that we could take out this daily low. The, the zigzags on this daily chart are still going down. They haven't turned up yet. So just to give you a feeling that this is not a perfect theory, it's just always defining things in terms of the waves and the swing highs and swing lows, as opposed to specific chart formations. And we'll see why this was important when we start to look at his oscillator look, uh, uh, oscillator work. Now, the dollar index, I just wanted to show a weekly and a monthly chart. I really only look at the monthlies on, on uh, markets like yield charts and the currencies. Um, as an aside, the higher time frame that you go to, the lower the noise level. I'm um, not so sure that monthly charts on grains are going to be relevant, but uh, definitely on the currencies, you'll see that they do have value. And this dollar index on the weekly chart, I wanted to point out to you that if you do use a canned indicator, because most of the software programs nowadays do have them, um, that they're... They're a little bit arbitrary in, in the way that they're computed in that it has to wait until that high is really formed. So it's always going to define it for you a little bit after the fact. So it can't draw this line really going down until we've hit red bars down. And in fact, we are still actually going up. So on, on the, uh, the monthlies, you know, there's still plenty of, of room here for this to eventually turn into a, a zigzag back up. I, uh, you have to be careful as to how much liberty you want to take in, in uh, seeing how things are going to unfold. But I uh, just wanted to show you that, that uh, it's not a perfect science there. What I really am looking forward to getting to, though, is some of his oscillator techniques. And then we're going to look at these in conjunction with zigzag patterns. So there's three main rules that he had in using his oscillators. The first is that he looked for the oscillator to turn before the price. In other words, momentum will tend to give an early clue before the price breaks. And we're going to see how that unfolds. And uh, most of you who have known my work over the years know that uh, the two-period rate of change tends to be my primary tool for end-of-day analysis, and it will very often give momentum clues that we'll look at more detail today. And then with longer-term oscillators, if you use a, a stochastic or a moving average oscillator um, or even a long-term rate of change, such as a 10-period rate of change, he actually used a five-period rate of change, we can draw long-term trend lines lines across those as well. And you'll see that when you get a penetration of these trend lines, it's like an early warning sign. It doesn't mean that you immediately go long or short. It means that you can wait for the next swing on the, uh, on the price chart. And we'll look at exactly how that's done. And then lastly, when you are drawing trend lines on the oscillators, we want to only draw an uptrending trend line on the oscillator if price is in an uptrend and vice versa. So they are there to support what's in the charts. So let me show you a couple examples. And, and my whole goal today is just to, to make you pull these things out on your own charts and look at them for yourself and play with it. Because the more that you work with the data, when the markets are closed, 
the more it draws you into them. Um, and I say that because when the markets are open and you're studying charts, we are so biased by the current action. Um, so it's always best to, to do this after the close. At the bottom of this chart, I have what Sclerou called his net change oscillator. This is nothing more than a one period rate of change, or you could use it as a one period momentum function. Now this is a bit noisy for most people to use, but I want to show you the way that Sclerou used it. So if you look right here on this little trend line here, you can see that we started to break the trend line right there, and at which point he would say, then draw the upsloping trend line, which I don't have on this chart, and be ready for the break of that. So let's look at this middle one here. You can see we actually broke the trend line first to the downside before we had another swing to the upside. And that's very often what happens with this. So that's why he said it's an early warning. And then the actual price higher low comes in anywhere from two to four days after. It's pretty cool. And then when we broke that trend line on the price, we start our downtrending channel. So this might not be everybody's cup of tea, but um, it's, again, an interesting concept to look at. And we're going to find ways to update this with our current market charts. So here you see that the trend line was first broken to the upside right around here, and we still came down three or four days before you got that final low and so forth and so forth. It's it's not a perfect uh, thing. You can see here that the uh, oscillator broke, whoops, right, right here, and we still went up for four or five days before at least coming down. So again, I, I don't know if I could actually make this work in my trading, but we're gonna take this idea and then adapt it. So here he also used a five period rate of change and keep in mind that he calculated all this out by hand so on this first chart of the gold we have the one period rate of change in the middle with the five period rate of change below and what Arthur Sclerou said is that the five period rate of change does a lousy job of capturing turning points he actually liked the short-term momentum functions for that but he could draw very long-term oscillators on them. And then he said that right about the time that those long-term oscillators started to converge is when the top or the bottom for the final swing would fall into place. And he didn't necessarily redraw his oscillators, so I don't mind that on this very bottom middle part we poked through it a bit, but you just get the feeling that it's it's supporting the concept of the rising wedge or the three pushes up. So here at the far left, we first poked up right where I've got that green line drawn. This is a better illustration than my previous cow chart. We first poked up and then we drew our trend line and came out above that two days later. Now, two things I found from studying this is that A, you might be a day late, it's not meant to capture the bottom, but if you entered after the breakout, you almost always get an ABC up or at least a couple more days to that trend. So in those instances, I don't matter that, uh, that you're, quote, a little bit late. It's not like you're trying to capture the top or the bottom, but I want some duration, some directional duration after I'm into these things. And same thing here on the top side. You can see that we broke the trend line on this one period rate of change right where this red bar is. And in fact, it's almost like a, a wide range reversal or a V top, something along those lines, but it's telling us that there is a radical shift in the supply demand imbalance, or you could call it a price rejection, all kinds of terms these days. But at that point, you could start drawing trend lines from the price. And then of course, obviously we broke that and had a good bonking down. 
keep in mind that these classical chartists had to do everything by hand. So they were very much into drawing the trend lines by hand on their charts and updating the data bar by bar. Some excellent lessons there. So just for fun, I thought, let me see where we are currently on this NASDAQ. Now this chart, unfortunately, is a, a week old. I can show you an updated chart if we have time on the end. But first of all, notice at the bottom how we had that radical shift in the supply demand, obviously a big short squeeze or whatever you want to call it. But that wasn't the bottom. We actually had to come down for the retest. And that's the point that you would have drawn the trend line. Remember, trend lines have to have defined data points. So you've got that right there. And then that's really where the change in the trendiness came about. Of course, everybody sees this after the fact, right? Um, and here's a case on the right where we actually broke to the downside but we haven't really broken an uptrending trend line yet. And, uh, and Sclerou addresses these issues. That's what's so very cool. He wasn't trying to come up with a science that's 100%. And he talked about situations, dealing in situations when we have whipsaws or whipsaws in the trend lines or the momentum indicators. And so it very much solidified that this is part of the game. This is part of trading. This is part of analysis. It's part of the game that lots of times you do end up redrawing trend lines or whatever the case may be. But now at the bottom of this chart, I have this five period rate of change and I try drawing the converging trend lines on it, just like uh, Sclerou alluded to. And uh, again, this is a couple days old and, and we don't know exactly when or where or how that price is going to form a top, but you can see it's getting pretty stretched there. And uh, you add a couple more days to this and we're pretty close to that apex. So that'll be really cool to see how that plays out now. Um, again, I think I have an updated chart somewhere on on my things that I can show at the end of this. Now, lastly, this was really cool, too, because Sclerou used a five-period rate of change. And I'm like, dang, that was like 45 years ago that he was using this. And again, if most of you have seen my previous YouTubes on Big Mike's or uh, Futures IO, you'll see that I, I use this five period rate of change a lot too. And that's what we did for our modeling of these extended runs. I'm like, hmm, you know, that's that's pretty cool that this people have been using this long before I, I, I stumbled upon it. And I plotted the five period rate of change as well as this simple moving average. And you can see how they could work very well together as a, as a chartist's confirmation or non-confirmation, uh, looking for the cells only, you know, the short-term trades to the short side when, when you're below the zero line or below that five period moving average. And there's just obviously a lot of correlation between these two. It's, it's not a perfect indicator and I'll show you why. Um, here's the crude, and you can see how many times that uh, the price just consolidates through this five period simple moving average. And I'm not sure I would be able to use this five period rate of change uh, for any good whatsoever on, on this type of data. But uh, he, he uh, definitely felt that it, it channeled and uh, he had his little tricks with that. So let's take some of his concepts, this drawing the trend lines across longer term oscillators. And you can do this on 30 minute charts, hourly charts, daily charts. And at the bottom of this chart, I have my 310 oscillator, which is nothing more than the difference between a 3 and 10 simple period moving average. And you can see that it does change channel, we could actually draw trend lines along these oscillators, the highs and lows, and it'll highlight channels, which of course the price is highlighted as well. So I could actually draw a lower trend line here too and see that the momentum was channeling down for two to three months in the bond market as indeed it consolidated sideways instead of really channeling down much. 
So um, that was a pretty powerful cycle low that we put in at the beginning of March. In fact, in hindsight, it was actually a, a bit of a bear trap there and, and so forth. And we're going to look too in this session as to how we can capture and frame out and harness these bull and bear traps through this cross through the box channel. But anyway, you can see this, this is something I want you to study for yourself that when this trend line is broken, okay, then you almost always get the next dip. So once that trend line's broken, you start to look for the A, B, C, okay? You might miss that A leg up, but then this is probably one of the easier trades in the world, that C leg. So let the market tip its hand, it consolidates and pulls back, and then rallies up. And that's probably one of the highest uh, risk reward trades you can make and it doesn't matter if it's on a 30 minute or 60 minute data I'm going to let you study and play with that for yourself that second leg that comes after that first break of the trend line so here's just a few little more um, for example this is the hourly S&P cash chart and at the bottom I also put the five period rate of change Again, it's not something that I use in my own trading, but I wanted to show for illustrative purposes how this works. Uh, I actually use this 310 period moving average up here. And you can see what I wanted to point out is that when the trend line was broken here, you had a little pullback here, but this is this was a sweet spot. And I know that hourly charts with gaps are not your ideal uh, continuous data uh, feed, but it, it still still works better than than anything else. I think same thing here. The trend line was broken to the downside at this point. This was right where the trend line was broken on this five period. So you, you could have entered there or you could have had a trade there. And same thing here. Obviously, the price broke hard, but you got this reaction and this reaction. And what I found is that what he saw as the first reaction after the trend line break was what I call my first cross buy or sell. Um, which is a little bit of a kitschy name, and that was just when this slow line goes below zero, whoops, I'm going to look for that first reaction up for a short trade. All right, same thing here when this slow line or this pink line, which is nothing more than a 16 period moving average of the 310, goes back up above zero, I'm going to look for the first pullback there. And it's not a perfect science, but you can play with this for yourself because um, it's a pattern that I've probably traded for 35 years, especially on the daily charts, uh, what I call that first cross buy or sell. All right, so have some fun with that, drawing trend lines, let the trend line break, then look for the middle part of the wave to make a trade. Now, here's what I want you to also think about. What we are doing in our analysis and our trading is one play at a time. All right, here's a trade. Here's this first cross buy or this pullback on an hourly charts. We're playing for one swing. We're not trying to forecast where are we going to be a week from now? How is gold going to play out? Is it going to rally up further? Is it going to kind of come out the downside? Everything should be one play at a time each day, one day at a time. And don't get caught up in thinking too far ahead. And it's tough because there's so much noise out there on the Internet with people offering their opinions and, and the, the televisions trying to have the punsters on there. Uh, where are we going to be, you know, a week from now, three weeks from now? What's the macro condition and stuff? I don't know of any traders that are making a living that way. So that's just my own two cents. This is a two period rate of change. Now this is what I use. I don't use that five period rate of change. I do use that 310. And what I wanted to show you here was simply when we did break the trend lines, I didn't draw one on the far left here, but I always am trying to look for the two visible data points. When we did break it to the upside, you still had more upside. So 
right here where this red arrow is, is where we broke this trend line to the downside. I'm not suggesting that you go short at that point. What I'm suggesting is that you think to yourself about that ABC rhythm. Here was the first leg down, a little bit of a consolidation. Maybe you're using hourly charts or 120-minute charts or even daily candles, but you did get a second down. And I find that that happens a good percentage of the time. Here, here on this green arrow is where we broke the trend line to the upside. All right, it's giving a change of character here, a change in the supply demand. After that, we did have one day high to low before continuing on our merry way. And we don't know if we're gonna go up two days, four days, six days. All I know is that we have a good risk reward entry point. First check up, check down, and then look for another leg up. So you start to see the rhythm, and only by tracking this yourself are you truly going to get the feel for it. Now, this was really interesting because we broke this trend line right here and still went up another day. And then this market actually had a lot of residual strength because even as we should have been correcting in this downtrending channel of momentum, it was pretty sloppy and really didn't give much downside. So again, it is not a perfect science. A lot of times these things do seem sort of gray and ambiguous, but you have to have something. Having some roadmap is better than having no roadmap. And it's, uh, you, you can see how you can play this game at all various points. You know, change in the supply demand imbalance. Now it's shifting to the downside. Look for some spot where you get continuation down. Same thing here. Change of character to the upside. Look where you get some continuation, back and forth. So you can play with that. I've got a lot more interesting things to show you. This is my first momentum volatility model that I did in the late 80s. I used to trade the OEX options every day. Um, and this actually is a chart that's in my new book that I wrote, so I will mention that. And this actually uh, was uh, back in the uh, early 90s, as you will see. What this is, is sorted rates of change. So I use anywhere from a three to a 12 period rate of change. You can play around that for yourself and I overlap them all on top of each other. And you can see when they cluster and get very close together, I also created an oscillator that was the max min. It took the difference between these. And when they were clustered around a zero point, that's where I would go in and I would buy straddles on the OEX. So I'm looking for an expansion in volatility, and uh, you don't always know when or where it's going to happen, but I would be long volatility or long gamma. And then once all the lines had fragmented and a move had unfolded and we got very noisy, I would go in and I would short straddles at this point. It was a pretty lucrative model, and I did this for, uh, for, for quite a number of years. Sometimes these days it's not as clean, but I'll show you some periods where it is clean too. And I'm gonna tell you the moral of this story. So usually what I'd do is I would short straddles and then uh, take them off you know, anywhere from four to five to six days later. You don't wanna press your luck too much. And usually I would stay long the volatility until there was an event and I uh, sort of had my own way of uh, of trading this, but that's uh, something interesting for you to look at. That, by the way, is in my book, and I just have to mention it because I don't sell it on Amazon. I don't sell it anywhere else. It's only available on my website, and I have a lot of fun charts in there as well as showing what my, my trading program has really been. So if you go to my website, you can read the first chapter uh, and see the table of contents and uh, make up your own mind. And by the way, it's not one of those $50 books. So onward and tally-ho. This is a Russell chart from uh, a couple years ago. And I wanted to show you what I really learned by looking at these equilibrium points. They tend to form at two types of configurations. They either form where you've got the point of a triangle, 
So you can see that right here. Or they form when there's a momentum divergence. So either or, you'll either be able to draw trend lines around the chart formation or you'll get a momentum divergence. And all of these spots are excellent spots to A, go and buy volatility, meaning buy straddles, or B, trade a volatility breakout system or a trend following type of style that's going to pull you into the trade. And we're gonna look at some really cool little triggers for that in the last part of this presentation. But you see how this really hasn't changed. So this is what the moral is on the principle of price behavior. And that is that some of the best moves and trends come from these equilibrium points where everybody's in agreement, where everybody's in balance. And that's interesting because when I first started trading, uh, my uh, focus was really on looking for the overbought and oversold areas, all right? And often that we do get a reversion to the mean or a reaction from those areas, but it's not really where the good trends come from. The good trends come from these equilibrium points. And another way of looking at that in uh, modern day terminology is when we look at auction theory and you start talking about the market being in balance and having these high volume nodes, these distribution nodes. And once the market starts to pull out of that, one side is going to be on the wrong side, either the bulls or the bears, and more money is going to be coming in, and you start to get these positive feedback loops, right? Okay, I know I'm not talking anything new there. This was natural gas, and I thought, I just have to show this on one or two other markets so that you get the idea. Uh, at the top here in natural gas, I'm sure that if you had a stochastic or a 310 oscillator or something, you would also see a momentum divergence. So that's a little bit different than that equilibrium level where you have the triangle. OK, but you see when the market pulls out of these points, we get the most bang for our buck in the least amount of time. And that's important to me because when I put on a position, I have exposure. The longer you're in the market, the more risk you have. So we really, in a perfect world, in a perfect theory world, want to find those spots in the market where we can be in the market for the least amount of time, yet capture the most amount of movement. And right here, obviously on these charts, you have this triangle feeling, but you know what happens? Sometimes our eyes get glazed over looking at these bar charts, you see? They kind of get glazed over, and it's almost like you can't really see anything anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Like if I covered up the data on the far right-hand side, it's almost like it can catch you off guard, just like that silver market falling out of bed today. But if you have some objective way of quantifying this max min point, and when it's around zero, you see, then it's almost like a trigger or a signal, like, hey, hey, I need to start playing a volatility breakout system or a trend following system or put in sell stops below the lows or et cetera, et cetera. It gets you in the mode of anticipating something. And the preparation and the anticipating and the stocking is a huge part of the game so that you're not forced to be reactive when these choice opportunities unfold. Here's another great example. And now I wanted to show you how you can create these max-min oscillators as well. So once again, we've got our cluster of our different rates of change, and this was on unleaded gasoline, probably had the best trend to the upside for the last uh, eight weeks. But look at these two data points. You can see right here, everything's pretty neutral. All right, obviously the chart has a good sideways line consolidation before it gets bonked down. And this is what I call positive feedback mode when all of these rates of change have the same slope to them, okay? That's really choice. If you can find the spots in the data, how do we capture these spots where all these are gonna have the same slope? And likewise here, okay, this was our, our triangle formation. It's not a divergence, you can see. Very neutral level of which we pull up, and that's where the trend began. Now, all I did was take the max min between these um, different lines here 
and I ran an RSI on that so that we can normalize this. And it is not a perfect oscillator. I don't look at this every day because I can pretty much see these things um, just, you know, with discretion now. Uh, but it will also help train your eye and get you playing with the data if you do create these things. So if I simply took the max min at these points and ran an oscillator, or here's another trick, okay, that is take the absolute reading of rates of change. So if I took a two period rate of change, the value of that for the last 10 days, and I only took the absolute value of that, and then I ran an RSI on that, it will also show these exact data points. So let me tell you exactly what I mean. Let's look back at 10 days worth of data and we had minus 10, plus 10, minus 8, plus 8, minus 6, plus 6. And as the market starts to tighten and coil, you'll see 2, minus 2, 1, 1, that type of thing. See, so if we sum these things, I'm getting 1, 1, 2, 2, no minuses or whatever. And then I run an RSI on that total. Bam! Okay, for those of you who are the mathematically inclined, another tool that you can have some fun with. Now, this was something that was forming in the Canadian dollar uh, just a couple days ago. We haven't broken out. Uh, I don't know if we broke the trend line today or not. Let me see here. Um, but you can see the coil that was forming on the uh, rate of change. It wasn't quite at that tight equilibrium level yet. Um, and I don't think the price has quite, we, we sold off sharply today. I don't think that price is still broken out of this triangle either, but um, this is going to be a good one to keep, keep your eye on because of the coiling in that and to see how that plays out. Okay. I will have lots of time for questions at the end of this as well. So let's look at a fun chart formation because I bet you 10 to 1, all of you have seen this uh, at some point, and this is very much hand in glove with auction theory. And this was what Sclerou called his counterswing measurement. And many, many years ago, I had a friend, Bob Uran, who traded a volatility breakout system, and he called this, if it happened on the intraday charts, the cross through the box very sexy little name there. So Sclerou said, if after breaking out on one side of a consolidation, think of a big rectangle, the price reverses and goes to the other side, it's probably going to proceed the same distance outside of that box as it did on the false breakout. So I first took a copper chart here, a daily copper chart, and you can see how we flush to the downside, giving a classic little bear trap there, right? Just a simple bear trap. And the best bear traps and bull traps are the ones that tend to come back into the range pretty quickly. So if you're looking for a price rejection spike, you want to see it get its tail back up there within a, within a one or three bars, all right? That's the best bull or bear traps, very sharp rejection. So I just marked off how much we poked through there and, uh, you know, measured that to the upside and um, voila, you know, what you will notice is these gray lines in the middle here. I took at the time that we did that bear trap, I summed up this data right here to give us the volume distribution. And those of you that are familiar with the high volume nodes or the points of control, these types of concepts from auction theory. Usually what happens is price will rally up to this point and sometimes it can find resistance. It doesn't guarantee that it's gonna come out the other end of the range, but this middle of the range is a really do or die type of spot for the market to play around with. And if it does go through there, then pretty good odds it's gonna come out the upper end of the range. And you can see that we did that almost perfectly. And here on the bonds, I actually took a yield chart. This is a 30-year yield chart for my long-term work. I like to use yield charts instead of the underlying contract because the roles are just a little messy uh, in, in the bonds. But we had a little bit of a false breakout to the upside here above that previous uh, swing high. 
it's not so dramatic. But then when we came back down below that, that little, see that little two-day trap there action in the yields, where did we immediately go to? To the volume node to the downside or the distribution level, the high distribution point, whatever you want to call it. And then we had to play around with that, whoops, for quite a bit. These things are like magnets before we then actually broke low. I, I don't think you could forecast that we were going to go down that much, but at least we did get our distance out that side, right? And this was uh, something that um, I was actually making these slides, and this happened on the very day that I was making these slides. This is a pit session S&P, and we did that. We poked above the morning high. Right, And when we started to come back down and we didn't find any support in the middle of that range, I said, by George, I know exactly what we're going to do. We're going to flush below this low. And of course, you know, the market always goes a lot lower than you think it's going to go, right? Uh, and this, this was around this 20, 28 to 71, and now we're close to that. We were close to that 2,900. But the play was here for to look back, to come back to the middle of this range. That was the play. So first, first, the failure up here forecasts that we can go back down to the middle of the range. If we don't hold the middle of that range, then there's pretty good odds that we'll flush below that morning low by an equal amount. It's just something you can play around with. And then, of course, if we come back into that range, well, you know, that, that volume note is your point again. Now, I know much, uh, many of you have seen my um, talks on extended runs because when we're taking markets bar by bar or every two to three days, the temptation is to, to be very um, much in the mode of looking for the little two to three day reversals. I mean, that's uh, Taylor was a big influence on my trading style. And so there's a little bit of a misconception that every two to three days there's a buy day or a sell short day. And actually, Nothing is further than the truth because if you read Taylor and you read between the lines, he'll say, on a fresh breakout, you skip the first sell short day or you skip the first buying day. In other words, let the market trend for five days before playing that little reaction. So you, so you really need to be careful about the way that you interpret somebody like that. So in modeling that, we started doing these extended run work for the number of days that a market trades on one side of a short-term moving average, right? This is just some of the uh, instances that lead to those types of runs. And at the bottom of this chart on the gasoline, all I did was put the difference between a one and five period simple moving average. It creates a histogram that makes it really easy to see when it has this better trendiness, if you will, or you could call it persistency of trend. And what we want to do is model what types of conditions precede these extended runs. So we put a lot of time and energy into that type of modeling. And you can see here this two-period rate of change actually made a new momentum high. I use a 30-day look-back period, a new momentum high, and the price was breaking out to new highs. Now, remember, if we drew our trend line across the tops here, you also broke that trend line. So it's just the start of a change of character. Very important that it's just the start of a move, you know, not a climax at the end of it. And of course, I'm not suggesting that you're necessarily going to get in on the first one or two days of this, but at the very least, it's going to keep you from looking for a sell short day or, or making a counter trend trade after that type of condition. Now, here's two things I want to point to you because this is very difficult to create in a mechanical system because you can see here this big low on the two-period rate of change, which indeed was a new 30-day low. But what it was was the momentum low, but not the price low. We're still in an overall uptrend here. So this is what we call a long liquidation flush. And same thing here. We made another 30-day low. It's a long liquidation flush in an uptrending market. And conversely, if we were in a downtrending market and you saw that, 
it could be a short covering rally or a short squeeze. So all of our momentum work that we do, be it with rates of change or 310 oscillators or stochastics, whatever, it, your, pick your poison. They're all the same to me because they're all a derivative of price. doesn't really matter. Everything we do is extremely important on context. You being able to put it into context. Is it a range market? Is it a trending market? Is it an uptrend or a downtrend? And this is something that's very difficult for computers to do, is to put this type of work into context because there is so much noise. So if you really throw yourself into this, you will have an edge an edge above those nasty little algos out there. God bless them, because they provide liquidity. So I wanted to show you here on another market, the NASDAQ. This was earlier in the year. And you see when we were making the new 30-day highs on this two-period rate of change, it was the first day up on the breakout, all right? It's the first day up. And just coming out of this line, so price was making new highs and the momentum was making new highs. And it set off. You can see the extended run periods here. Now, once again, I wanted to point out the times that this doesn't work. Always important to study the cases where it doesn't work because you can learn a lot from that, too. We had a long liquidation flush, an extreme momentum low here, but it's in the context of an uptrend. You still didn't have any distribution top. You're still in uptrending channels. It was a nice flush of weak hands. And same thing with here as well. Okay, we had the long liquidation flush, but we didn't get any follow through. So I have to show you those two examples. Lastly, you never know how far it's going to go, all right? Uh, the best thing you can do is trail a stop. And when you get those rare cases where the, the stars line up and you can trail a stop, even then, you have to keep in mind it's a numbers game. Maybe only 30% of those trades will be big wins. So you really need to do your homework and have a lot of confidence in the numbers and statistics behind this so you don't get discouraged if you get a couple false breakouts or false starts. But I promise you that you will catch big wins that more than make up for all the aggravation. That's probably true of any trend following technique. I don't consider this to be a trend following technique. I consider it to be following the supply demand imbalance and the market is telling us something by this aberration. Now, of course, the scaling here is all squished up because we did have such an extreme move in the hogs. So at the time, this momentum high right here was really dramatic, really dramatic. And what I want to show you is very cool because we still made a higher high in momentum and we made an even higher high in momentum. So this is called one time framing where you've got these continuous higher lows all the way up in auction theory or market profile work that's called one time framing i call it extended run or persistency of trend and it will tend to continue until the market comes into balance and what does the market have to do to come into balance for all of you profile aficionados out there you need to see three bars of price overlap. So more often than not, a trend is going to end by the market coming into balance with these three bars of price overlap, or maybe about 20% of the time, it will end in a sharp V type of reversal. I call those wide range reversals, all right? And then, of course, you're, you know, you're still playing one data point at the time while we come back down to our 20 period moving average, grail by, yada, 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 yada. The DAX recently gave, recently, I guess this is two weeks old, new momentum highs on this two period rate of change, new price highs. And here's what I lastly want to emphasize to you, this sequence that you get range expansion or breakaway gap or and or new two-period rate of change highs. These signals don't come along that often. 
but don't ignore them when they do, because you saw this DAX continued up, and, and it was a very strong indication that these S&Ps still had more upside to go. Okay, let's just look and see quickly at how this works on some stocks, because this is like the main thing I like to see on stocks. And I'm just going to give you two considerations for all you stock traders to, to really keep in mind. Here's the hard thing with stocks, is that we like to trade them, some people do, just as if they're futures, but they're really not. It's like they're, I, I think they're more of a position type of market, a position type of trade, you know, or, or uh, take, take advantage of them through options somehow, you know, uh, call spreads or, or, you know, those types of things. But here's our trigger. We have breakaway gap, new momentum highs, new price highs, and then lastly, Remember that 310 oscillator that I showed you at the beginning? This is the 16 period slow line of that rate of, of, of that oscillator. I just overlaid it on top of the two period rate of change. And I love, love, love looking to trade against the slope of this. So as long as this has a positive slope, I want to keep thinking buy pullbacks to this or, or stay long, stay with the position as long as you've got this, this trendiness up there. Just show you a couple real quickly because I don't, I know that most of you trade futures, but this was on, on the gold, this, the uh, gold trust here and same thing happened on the actual gold chart. I just had the slide uh, for a different type of product. But you can see that we did have our upside breakout with new momentum highs on the two period rate of change. And then, of course, we got this extended run, this trendiness there. Home Depot, a, a couple examples here. This was classic breakaway gap, range expansion, new two period rate of change highs. I'm just thinking stay long or trade this to the long side. Um, and here's where the real gravy is for those of you that have your pension fund or in, in more investment mentality. You have to look at the weekly charts, okay, because that's going to be the driver for you. These are triggers. These are triggers, but I need to have that weekly structure that we're just coming out of a weekly pennant or a weekly buy ante, or a weekly divergence. I need to have that weekly momentum oscillator pattern. I need to know that I've got that wind behind my back, and then this is just the trigger, all right? I'm only going to say that once. But here's what's so cool. Now, some of the stocks I showed you, we were in a very strong uptrending market there in March and, and end of February. But this doesn't depend on the overall market environment because here we actually had a great easy trade on the short side with U.S. Steel. And if you were to look at the weekly chart, you'd have this gorgeous textbook bear flag there right to the moving average. It couldn't have been more symmetrical and, and prettier. All right, so you can see I marked off right where we had that new momentum lows. It's not too late, even if you bought put spreads on the close of that day or shorted call spreads, however you want to capture it, it's not too late. That's the beautiful thing about combining this momentum indicator with the weekly charts. It's not too late. I'm an old dog now, okay? I can't have reflexes that depend on me getting in on a one-minute pullback and, and so forth and so forth. I need to know that if I get in late on a signal, there's still something left for me. Okay, and this, this was cool too. This was right when the tech stocks were breaking out. The, the, the semiconductors, the fangs, everything was breaking out to the upside after the FOMC meeting, except for the banks and some of these financials. And if you looked at the weekly charts, there was a good distribution up there. Now, right at this point, USB, this is, this is USB, it still sold down for five more days, and it got down to this level here, 47.56. 
See, so we don't need to listen to the pundits on TV. We don't need to read the blogs. You just need to look at the market and the price and what it is telling you. Very much my philosophy. This was pretty cool because uh, we caught this right as it was happening. This was on the same uh, same period there in the markets. New two pair rate of change highs on here. And what I've got on my trade station is I have a scanner. I just keep 30, 300 stocks in my database, right? And it'll just give a little alert or a flag when you're making a new 30 day high. It's it's so easy. You have to find a way to simplify your process, you know, because I don't have time to go scanning through 300 charts every day. But it just gives a little alert that it's making the new highs, and then I can I can take a look at it and see if I want to capture it or not. Now this right here at the time was 160, and it proceeded to run up to 191. So there was plenty of upside in that market. Plenty of upside. MU, okay, I don't want to board you with this stuff, but I'm just going to show you one last little trick now that's a play on this, and that's taking the inverse. Remember when I told you that you could get false signals in the two-period rate of change when it makes new lows or new highs, but it's against the trend. And we want to define the trend you could define it any way. You can use moving averages, you know, one one moving averages below another moving average. Uh, here I'm using a CCI, which is essentially a standard deviation function. I think this is a, a 40 period CCI. Um, I found there's no right or wrong parameters. That's what's so cool about this stuff. There's not any right or wrong parameter. And what I did is I said, okay, if the CCI is above uh, the 60 line or the 100 line, however strict you want to make it, and we get those new 30-day momentum lows or whatever look back you want to program in there, then give me an alert, okay? And here you can see at the top, this was crude. It actually gave a little buy there because I got that flush there. And then we had two days to the upside. Same thing here. You got a little buy and we had two or three days to the upside. So this is just a short-term trading tool. It's not meant to have any long-term forecasting value. Um, by the way, these little these little blue bars are when there's an extreme uh, trendiness. So you see, you can create this game so many different ways. Trade by colors, indeed, right? And then here, all right, we had new rate of change highs, but we were in a downtrend. And again here, and again here. And again here. So usually the last one in a sequence is going to be the most dicey, but the first one or two are good. Now, let's take this a step further, all right? I don't, I don't really do this on the daily bars. I'll show you one or two more, and then I'm going to show you where the real fun is. So here you can see we actually had... A, sh a short signal coming off that low, coming off that bottom. We definitely broke the trend lines here. There was a change of character. You still did have a little bit of correction down. Not ideal by any means. And here we got a wonderful buy, all right, which actually was a, a much better one. You see the frequency of these signals is not very often. You might get four a year on a daily chart, but Let's go down to intraday data. This is a five-minute chart of natural gas. This actually is CQG. And I don't have these things up here, by the way. I don't sit there and put a two-period rate of change on a five-minute or hourly data. That would be ridiculous. I'd be drooling in a corner, okay? But I just saw it. I wanted to show you how this is created. All right, and you can do this. You can try this with a one period rate of change or a five period rate of change or CCI of any length. I'm just giving you ideas to play with you guys because I want you to do your own work. I want you to have some fun and, and, and you know, you're not going to come up with a mechanical system. I promise you that. I promise you're not going to come up with something that's just a little printing press, but you can create great little roadmaps as indicators. So this is on natural gas. It's just telling you like a little flag pattern, a little flag pattern. And then here is how it looks on TradeStation. And I can have these little things pop up as alerts. And they work on five-minute data, 15-minute data, 30-minute data, any type of data. It's just 
a kitschy little way of highlighting a flag or a retracement in a trend. And before you think it's the cat's meow, sometimes they give you indications two or three bars too early. So you still need to, to watch the tape and time it yourself. As you can see right here on this pullback in the EC, right? Okay, it's, it's giving you an alert that you're getting a pullback in an uptrend, but you still went a few more bars down. And sometimes you get this, here's Amazon and ABC formation, but you know, I'll sit there all day long waiting for, you know, two or three choice trades. It's not like we're banging away making dozens of trades. And we're not necessarily banging away taking all these signals, but it's fun. It keeps you watching the market, staying in rhythm with it, not overthinking things, following the market, which is more important than anything following the price action, letting it tell you it's a pullback or a new momentum high, you see? So it keeps you in the moment. I can watch dozens of charts like this. It doesn't mean that I'm trading them, but I would so much rather be constantly watching these types of things than having a TV on in the background, or worse yet, pulling up email and getting distracted and losing my focus. Okay, because you're supposed to be a professional. You want to make money, you need to have a professional mindset. That means you need to be doing your job. You don't need to be, you know, playing around on the internet doing other stuff. So this, I'd rather be, you know, doing research and indicators and playing with this stuff. But this is, we, we try to make, um, we try to make at least one or two trades in the morning session because that's where the most amount of trendiness is on five minute charts, you know, just like a little scalp. It's just like a little profit center. You're not gonna, you know, buy a million dollar house doing that, but it's uh, it's fun. So that's, that's the whole boil down where all of that derived. Um, and then just to reiterate, you know, this this is what I do, trying to take one day at a point you know I these signals are just little spots where the two peer rate of change flips up or down after after two bars and it's it's uh, definitely a bit of pattern recognition like reading tea leaves but um, you know this is this is what I've been doing for 35 years and it's just what works for me now one more uh, one more little aside I know these charts will be up if you want to go and study them I uh, I don't want to run over too long here um, the pinball buy, okay? I just wanted to reintroduce that because it's one more gimmick on a momentum function. It's taking that one period rate of change that Sclerou has in his book, his net change oscillator, and we're simply running a three period RSI on it. Now there's a catch, okay? Because in the Street Smarts book at that time when we did our testing, I didn't have the 20 period EMA in there as a trend filter. So if you are going to look for these spots, these little pinball buys as I call them, I only look at the long side when the price is above that 20 period EMA and vice versa. Okay, ignore these little blue dots. That's that's another two hour lecture at another date and, and time that'll just confuse everybody. But but these uh this RSI here at the bottom is um simply when you've got that pinball buy setup. By the way, the blue dots, in case you're wondering, are simply when the slope of that two period rate of change the slope of the 310 oscillator fast line and the slow line are all in the same direction. So there are little spots where the market could have that positive feedback, which is what we started our whole lecture with, looking when we have the pull out of that equilibrium level and all the lines have the same slope together. And what you'll see, even on these charts, is that it doesn't last too long. Okay, you can get these very sharp moves, a couple days, two, three bars. We want it to go on forever and ever because it feels so good when you're in there. But you need to also be trailing a stop or be mindful about it's not going to last forever. So lastly, these are just pinball cells that unfolded on the yen at the time. This was the indicator. Um, there was a rock dot cell. And that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I know I covered a lot of a lot of uh, 
material. This was just trying to sum it all up for you, showing that hog chart again one more time where we did make those new momentum highs on that two period rate of change, price highs, range expansion. The market's telling us something that's going on. Of course, everybody knows that they had to kill a million pigs over in Asia from the swine flu. All right, there's always a reason or a driver you're going to find out why. But even if we didn't know the news or the fundamentals or have a TV or read anything, Mr. Market's going to tell us anyway. And then right here, our one little pullback, our pinball buy, there's always a spot to get on at some point. All right. Thank you guys so much for attending today. I, uh, I, I really appreciate it. And I really am just going to be... Uh, a little bit of a promote right here. I want to put my book back up because there's so many fun stories in this book and lessons I learned from other traders as well as charts. And, and most of the book uh, you'll see is about me being on the wrong side of, um, of outlier events because that's part of trading. It's part of risk, you know. So, uh, you know, you hear plenty of people pounding their chest and thumping their chest about all their they're bad trades. I mean, they're good trades, right? Well, uh, here's a couple doozies in this book that will give you inspiration that if I could make back these losses, you'll find that anybody can make back losses. And it's, it's pretty funny. I really wanted to pass on some of the culture and the lessons I've learned from other greats all through the ages. So you can go there and read the first chapter. Um, with that, let me see where I have questions. I'll read them out to you, Linda. Okay. Uh, let's see. I apologize if it's obvious. Is your two-period ROC a percent or of a net change in value? It's a net change in value. And um, you'll see that with most charting software programs, they have a CAN function. It'll either be called rate of change or momentum. The shape of them is exactly the same, um, pretty much. But... Uh, uh, yeah, it's simply a, a, a net change type of function. Okay. Uh, there's a lot. I'm trying to weave through real quick. Uh, can you give the three number settings on Trace Station for the daily ROC? The default are 1414. Sure. Um, it, it, the 310 oscillator. So if you look where there's a moving average oscillator, um, if you just took the difference between a 3 and 10 period simple moving average, and then you run a 16 period simple moving average of that, that's all it is. Okay. Is there a certain amount of months or years back you use for your weekly charts? Um, boy, that's an interesting question. Um, I think you just need to have enough data that you you know it, you can get some feeling of the cycles, and uh, you know usually two or three years will be enough if you're looking at an oscillator to get a sense of the cycle, or if there's a momentum pattern. I mean. My favorite source of data, if I want to look at really long-term charts, is I go to MRCI.com, Steve Moore's site, and he's got weekly uh, data, you know, beautiful data going back 30 years. So if you really wanted to see where previous highs and lows were, um, that type of thing. But if I'm just doing momentum work, I find that, um, you know, two and a half to three years is, is a good enough for me to see the cycles and the and the oscillators. Okay. Uh, oh, I just lost it. Where did you go? Can you elaborate on the three bar overlap? Yeah, that's called the three bar triangle. In fact, I'm just going to be really cool here and slide something over for you. All right, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So this was actually the Canadian dollar, which had a down move today. Take a look right here 
and you can see how this bar had a lower high than the two-day high and a higher low than the two-day low. So that's called, I call that a three-bar triangle. And very often, not always, of course, you'll get a trend move out of that. So for example, right here at this part of the chart, you see another three bar triangle. The market has come into balance. And obviously it looks like there was some report here because it spiked up first and then came down. But we do seem to get pretty good trend in the, if you wanted to be really careful, you know, wait for the morning numbers to get out of way. And there's nothing wrong for looking at like a, an intraday morning continuation pattern, a five or 15 minute uh, flag or continuation pattern. And now just so that you know, it's not a perfect science because you can see here, this little doji bar, um, the high was below the two day high and the low was above the two day low and we looked like we were breaking out and we failed. So, but this right here is the classic setup. So I think we had a couple of them today. Uh, there you go, here's silver. So you see the three bar triangle that was in silver that led to the downside. There you go. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Can you explain the CCI again? The CCI, it's, you know, it's not an indicator that I ever have on my charts. I believe it's called the uh, Commodity Channel Index. And if you want to Google it, um, you'll see that it's it's basically a standard deviation function. Um, so think about Bollinger Bands having tight Bollinger Bands, and when they start to widen, you know, uh, you'll usually have a, a rising standard deviation there. And um, so so um, I, I think that historically people have looked at, you know, using it with a 20-day look-back period, which is very similar to looking like a stochastic or something. I know Price Heatley did long-term work on charts, like with a 60-period CCI. So um, it's another tool you can play around with. Honestly, this is the first time I've ever used it to define a trend um, for an indicator. And just because I have a, a friend who liked to use it for very long-term uh, stock chart work. So I was like... Oh, let's let's play around with that and see see if we can create something. What is the pink line overlaid on your ROC? Yes, that is the uh, that's the slow line on the three ten oscillator. So, for example, if I just simply added, uh, let's see here. There you go. So all I did was take this slow line here from my 310 and I just overlaid it on top of this. So it just, you know, here, it's another way of saying, is there a trend in the momentum? All right, that's all. And then you can also look at, if you didn't want to look at uh, that, you could simply look at the, the, a moving average. Um, you know, uh, if, if we're above or below a moving average, there's, there's lots of games you can play uh, trading against something, trading against a moving average or against the slope of a moving average or against the slope of momentum. You know, it's a, it's a great little trick to play around with. Do you always use LBR bars? LBR bars. I am not sure what LBR bars are. Um, I'm not either. I basically use, I basically use, use uh, just charts like this, bar charts like this. I'll only use the, um, I only use the candlestick charts on, on daily data. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an intraday candle person. I never have been because I've really focused more on the rhythm with the oscillator. And then this this red green red rule here is simply uh, an average true range function that was originally defined by Wells Wilder in a book that he wrote 25 years ago. So I can't take credit for that. It's uh, simply if you push down by a certain average true range function, the bar turns red. And if it turns up, 
it's it's going to turn green it's it's not a mechanical signal at all you won't you won't turn it into a mechanical system it's a pattern recognition tool see so my eye likes to see these abc's remember we were talking about how scleru saw everything in terms of zigzags and if you can find those zigzag spots in the marketplace right there's some of the best reward risk reward once you have that abc or that zigzag so it's just a helpful little tool um, for my eye that's all Can you mention again the name of the book that you uh, mentioned at the start of the webinar? Yeah, it's Techniques of a Professional Commodity Chart Analyst. And his name is Arthur Sklaru, S-K-L-A-R-E-W. Okay. All right, I think that's all the uh, questions for today. Um, thank you for the webinar, for the information, and for spending some time with us this evening. See, and now I've, I've taken care of everybody's weekend, right? Everybody can sit there in front of their computer screens and play around with all this stuff, and, uh, and that's going to be your life, huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye.